tonight on Wings. Take off with the Discovery Channel in the F-14 Tomcat. Today, the F-14 is the aircraft carrier's first line of defense. Celebrated in the movie Top Gun, Tomcats first proved their worth over the Gulf of Sidra in 1981, where Libyan Su-22s proved no match for the swift and agile Tomcats. Tonight, soar high with the F-14 Tomcat on wings. On the 25th of February, 1979, the Russian warship Minsk slipped through the Turkish Straits and into the Mediterranean. Classed as a cruiser to comply with Turkish regulations, the Minsk was nonetheless an aircraft carrier. But its comparatively small size and total commitment to vertical takeoff warplanes gave Western analysts a chance to study Soviet thinking on naval aviation. Clearly, Soviet strategists did not believe they had a need for large carriers able to support a wide variety of aircraft. American thinking, on the other hand, has gone towards the development of massive carriers, often nuclear-powered. These, the largest of man's mobile creations, are able to convey and support several different types of aircraft. Carriers provide the U.S. with the option of sending its potent air power to areas where it does not control airstrips, as was the case in various stages of the Second World War the Korean conflict, Vietnam, and more recently, the Persian Gulf. American attack carrier can only be perceived as the ultimate gunboat. But if an aircraft carrier is to provide the weapons, it is also an inviting target. With up to 5,000 lives and an almost irreplaceable amount of technology, aircraft carriers are vulnerable to aerial attack. To counter this threat, the United States Navy relies almost entirely on one remarkable aircraft, the Grumman F-14 Tomcat. America's involvement with carrier forces is greater than any other nation. It was aircraft from the Japanese Carrier Task Force that devastated Pearl Harbor guaranteeing U.S. participation in World War II.
It was only from the deck of the carrier Hornet that Jimmy Doolittle was able to lead the B-25 retaliation attack on Japan. Although the attack caused little damage, it broke the myth very early in the conflict that the Japanese homeland was beyond Allied reach. The Battle of the Coral Sea again proved the potency of the carrier-launched aerial attack. But it was Midway that was to prove the greatest carrier-against-carrier -carrier conflict. It was the American victory there that would set the trend for the remainder of the war. Midway was to show the strength of carriers. It also demonstrated they were vulnerable from the very type of aircraft they carried. Since that time, it has always been the threat of aerial attack that has been uppermost in the minds of carrier commanders. In the mid-1950s, the principal threat to American carrier forces still came from the air. Russia had developed long-range maritime reconnaissance bombers, such as the Tu-20 Bear. Powered by massive turboprop engines driving counter-rotating propellers, the Bear was not fast compared to fighters of the time, but could carry supersonic anti-ship missiles, which could be launched with devastating effect. Against this combination of long-range and advanced missile technology, the U.S. Navy had to completely rethink the role of its fighter aircraft. To counter the Soviet threat, the Navy had to develop a very special aircraft, not a fighter in the tradition of previous conflicts, rather a long-range all-weather interceptor. To fill the role, McDonnell Douglas developed the F-4 Phantom II. The F-4 Phantom II was a massive plane for its time. It provided the speed, altitude and range that would keep missile carrying aircraft at a safe distance. Its most important feature, and a break from previous convention, was the use of two crew members, a pilot and a radio intercept officer. The RIO provided the pilot with valuable radar and target tracking information.
The pilot's role was to get the aircraft as close as possible to its prey. Because the F-4 was designed around another revolutionary concept, it had no guns, only radar-aimed missiles. The Phantom not only proved a successful aircraft for the Navy and the Marine Corps, but was also adopted by the Air Force for a variety of fighter, reconnaissance, and ground attack roles in Vietnam. With its Sidewinder and Sparrow missiles, the F-4 was often successful against enemy MiGs, but it had to be upgraded with a cannon for close encounters with the lighter Russian-made fighters, which were more agile and hence extremely dangerous. Intelligence data gathered on the improvements to Soviet cruise missiles and their launch from aircraft, ships, and submarines continued to worry U.S. naval strategists. They knew from their own experiments the devastating effect this new type of weapon could have and asked the obvious question, could an anti-missile weapon be developed? Hughes Weapons Division thought so. They offered the AIM-54 Phoenix missile which, although having the disadvantage of being large and heavy, could lock onto another missile at a range of 50 miles. The problem now was to find an aircraft that could carry the Phoenix and still fly fast over long distances. For some time, just such an aircraft had been contemplated by Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara in a project named TFX, or Tactical Fighter Experimental. Later designated F-111, two versions had been contemplated, the Air Force version and a carrier-based Navy fighter to be given the all-important task of fleet defense. The principal differences in the two airframes were in the forward fuselage, the landing gear, and the wingtip. The shorter forward fuselage on the Navy version would accommodate a folding radome for carrier deck parking. The station geometry, provision for escape, subsystems, and oxygen system are the same in both cockpits and controls, displays, and instrument systems were made common wherever practical. When the wings were swept back, a near optimum configuration for low drag, high-speed flight was produced. Although the TFX project was mainly the brainchild of General Dynamics, most of the Navy's F-111B was subcontracted to Grumman Aviation. The F-111B, while a multi-role fighter, also had to accommodate the massive Phoenix missile. However, because the basic design called for a medium tactical strike aircraft, the overall concept resulted in a plane the Navy considered far too heavy for carrier use. By the time this rare footage of the Navy's version of the TFX was shot, the project had already been abandoned, and the carrier trials were a mere formality. This despite several successful firings of the Phoenix. The principal problem of the F-111B may have been the inability to reduce the aircraft weight below 80,000 pounds. But there were also other problems, including the undercarriage, side-by-side -side crew position, and a general lack of pilot visibility on landing. At no stage was the Navy, with its special needs, optimistic about adopting a fighter, which in every other way was an Air Force bomber. By the late 60s, the Defense Department recognized it had no replacement for the now aging Phantom. Worse still, information was becoming available that Soviet engineers had produced land-based swing-wing fighters with superior performance. The problem was summarized in 1968 by Admiral Thomas F. Connolly. There is the ever-present threat 